Hello and welcome to Connected TV for 2014. My name is Tammy Lindy and I'll be your host, bringing you some interesting interviews, stories and bands from our great southeast. Joining us on the show today, Richard Jordan, a local and up and coming playwright, and RSPCA Senior Media and Community Advisor, Michael Beattie. Later in the show, we'll be out on location with Care Flight's helicopter rescue pilot, Adrian Park. But first up, I have the pleasure of speaking with a very popular mayor, currently in his third term of serving his beloved city of Ipswich, Paul Pasali. Welcome to the show, Paul. Pleasure, pleasure, Danny. Lovely to have you. Now tell me, you had the privilege of meeting the Royals recently. Absolutely, it was just great. Yeah? Um, Prince William, it was funny because everybody was telling me, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, don't forget the bow, don't forget to that. And I, he came straight up to me and I said, welcome back, Prince. And um, I said, thanks for being here in 2011 with the floods. And um, we started talking and we just really related really well. And um, I related a story to him when he was here in um, 2011. We were doing a tour, one of the, the community halls, meeting all the flood victims. And, oh, um, yes. and as we came up to the first victim, she looked up at him and says, Prince, we've got something in common. And I'm thinking, what could this be? <laughs> and um, she said, we're getting married on the same day. Oh, and quick lovely. as a flash, he said, I'll invite you to my wedding if you invite me to yours. So the first thing he said when he saw me, you know that lady didn't invite me to a wedding? And I said, did you? He said, no, I forgot to. So <laughs> we started laughing and so we related stories. And, oh, that's fantastic. You know, I, I just think that it always relates to what I say. No matter who you meet, it's not mm. their position or their title. We all have a responsibility and we're all equal. It was, it was just great. I loved it. That's fantastic. That's yeah. so exciting. Now tell me, You've been in local government for quite a period of time now. Yeah. Um, can you tell me what is it that drives you? What is, what is it that creates your passion for Ipswich and the local surrounding areas? Look, I, I just love my job. I think it's like um, waking up every morning and being a kid in a candy shop. You, <laughs> you don't know what your day entails, but I think too many politicians worry about getting re-elected. Yeah. Your job is to actually make the life of people better. Yeah. Um, your life is about every day um, coming up with challenges. Like the other day, that, that poor... Um, uh, war veteran, um, you know, Scott and Susan, um, you know, Gardner that lost their home, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, we were able to go in very quickly and deal with the issue. And yesterday I had him out to lunch and, oh, and you know, they're starting to get back on their feet. And what he understands what's really important is not my title, but he mm. sees the care and compassion. Yeah. I just love this city. I love the people, but I've taken away the borders. Yes. You know, we, we're now recognised all over Australia and all around the world for a lot of things with care and compassion. It's how we care for people. Absolutely. I just can't stand these people who just want to get up people and hurt people. And sometimes the media, mm. you know, like we've got freedom of the press. Let's yeah. not abuse it. It's yeah. not about destroying people. It's about the facts. And that's why shows like this are fantastic because you can, you can give the good stories, the heart and soul. The people are out there making a better community. So... The kids Absolutely. of the future are going to have a great city. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and look, that is what this show is all about, the good stories. Yeah, it's great. Look, can I ask quickly as well, the NGAA, which is part of that, that yep. development and looking after the community, um, providing, you know, growth mm -hmm. and opportunity for the future populations. You're the chief of that council. Yeah, can yeah. you tell me a little bit about the vision of well, where they're at? What we did was get all the growth councils around Australia, the ones that are on the outskirts of capital cities, like yep. we're with Brisbane. Brisbane needs us more than we need them. Yeah. Because if Brisbane doesn't embrace growth in the Western Corridor, mm. they're going to have the Clem 7 tunnel, the Clem 8, the Clem 9, the congestion <laughs> will destroy their lifestyle. Absolutely. So we've showed the government, so I've got all the growth councils around Australia together as one voice. Yes. Saying, work with us and we'll make a better country. And so we've done the research and governments that invest in infrastructure into growth get a return on investment. Oh, wow. And unfortunately, governments like to invest in marginal seats. Mm -hmm. Stop playing politics. Do the right thing by Australia and Australia will do the right thing by you. And you know what? You know, I get elected not because people like me, but because they know that I care for the community yeah. and I'll look after them. And, you know, you know, I'm not involved in any political party, but I tell you what, I'll work with everybody. and. Um, I think too many people, they love electing a Premier and a Prime Minister and then they spend the next four years trying to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. You know, my job is whoever the Prime Minister is and the Premier, let's work together and get the right infrastructure in and what we're about is making sure infrastructure is is, is in the is growth there. area, not in the marginal seats. That sounds great. Thank you so much for being with us, Paul. I really appreciate oh, sharing this time. Great. It's great to have you here. Thanks. And join us after the break where you can stay connected.
Welcome back. My next guest is well-known radio and television presenter Michael Beatty and special guest Addie the Dog. Michael is working with the RSPCA currently as their Senior Media and Community Advisor. Welcome to the show, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is little Addie here. <laughs> um, I'm afraid she's just young. She's only four months old and she had her first ride in the car. And oh. With all the studio and the lights, she's uh, yeah, she's a little, she's okay. whinging a little bit, but That's she's happy. Okay. Yes, we love you, don't we, Addie? <laughs> now, Michael, obviously, people would know your face from all of the television reporting you've done over a number of years. But you, you've been working with the RSPCA now for about ten years, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I did uh, thirty-five years working for different sort of television programs, and then uh, before that, radio in Canada and the BBC and stuff. And, yeah. Uh, I think it worked out as one one war, two revolutions, wow. uh, three coups, and two royal weddings. So you've it certainly was, seen a lot then. <laughs> it was interesting, but uh, it, it, in many ways, actually, the RSPCA is more challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit more about your work with the RSPCA and what you do there? Yeah, well, I, I, I said I'd help out for uh, six weeks, and that was, uh, as you said, nearly ten, <laughs> ten years, years ago. ago. I might let her just have a no, little wander. No, that's wand fine. She can have a wander around the studio. <laughs> yeah, she, she likes you. Uh, uh, but yeah, um, it's uh, what I basically tried to do is obviously lift the profile of the RSPCA because it's it's a cause I obviously believe in. Absolutely. Very, very strongly. I mean, in an, we're one of those organisations that would love to be made redundant. Mm. But sadly, it seems that the need for the RSPCA seems to keep growing. I mean, Absolutely. all our shelters are, are, are full at the moment. Mm. And, uh, but, but the one thing that uh, Queensland RSPCA has that the other state RSPCAs don't is that we actually have a dedicated wildlife hospital. Oh, so wow. we, we actively deal with wildlife, whereas the other state RSPCAs actually don't. Sure. Um, so now that we've moved out to Wacol, uh, we actually have a, a, a full wildlife hospital that's oh. dealing with around 15,000 native animals every year. That's fantastic. So it's it, it's it's certainly full on, and mm. you, you know every day I'm quite seriously in awe of the work that our, our vets and animal attendants, inspectors, ambulance officers do on a daily basis. And yeah. Really, I'm in a way just the messenger. Absolutely, and that's such a great thing too. Now, if, if anybody in the community wants to get involved with the RSPCA or they find an injured, obviously wildlife is available, but any sort of injured animal or pet, is there a way that they can get in touch with the RSPCA to get involved or bring them to a centre? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you can either obviously bring them into us mm -hmm. uh, or you can call 1300 Animal. Yep. And, and that's a number we set up about four years ago. Sure. Uh, and that's, if you like, the hotline. Yeah. So if you've found an injured native animal, if our ambulance officers can't get out there personally through our, our network with other wildlife carers, and that's yep. up and down the state, sure. uh, we'll get somebody there as, as quickly as possible. That's great. That's so that's encouraging to know yeah, that yeah, no, that's well supported. Now, people can go and, and um, adopt homeless animals and things like that from the shelters. Yeah. I know several of my friends have done that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. We've got nine shelters throughout Queensland. Yep. The main one, as I say, is in, in, in Wacol. Yeah. But you can also look at the animals that are available online. Oh, great. And a lot of animals are available for adoption through uh, foster care. Oh. Because it, it, we'd like to get as many animals as we can yeah. out into foster care rather than having them sit around in a shelter, which Absolutely. even though it's, it's, it's in... It's in brand new facility mm. it's much better for an animal to be in a, in a, home. In a home situation Absolutely. so you can actually adopt directly from foster and little Addie there who's now wandered off and <laughs> I think she's gone looking for the biscuits just outside <laughs> More than likely. Um, but she's obviously available for adoption she's four months old and yep. in case you thought she was really small have a look at the size of her paws she's oh, yeah. actually going to be a bit bigger she is going to grow just a little bit more yeah. <laughs> absolutely no worries well thank you so much for coming on the show today um michael it's been a pleasure to have you and look if you want any more information about the rspca and the five freedoms for animals you can get that information on our website <laughs>
Let's have a listen to what he had to say to our team. Uh, an average day for us begins with the pre-flight of the machine, which is a, a maintenance inspection. We go over it with a fine tooth comb. The engineers have already gone over it. Uh, we check a whole bunch of different things, uh, component-wise and maintenance-wise, to make sure the machine's OK. Then we may then move on to washing the machine, which every pilot loves, not. Um, but we do, uh, that's part of the maintenance stuff, so we'll do that. There's a whole bunch of things that are involved with ongoing training and also our ongoing proficiency in terms of understanding and remembering all the different components of the machine and how to operate those, but then all the air law stuff. So there's a lot of ongoing kind of study that we'll do when we're sitting around waiting for a job to come in. So if it's a rescue, like a, like a cliffside rescue or a, a bushwalker or a motor vehicle accident, then what will happen is we get that call. Uh, we generally get airborne in about 10 minutes, so it's a bit of a team effort. I'll do some flight planning, work out where, how we're going to get to where we need to from, from here to point B, wherever that might be. The crewman will run out and drag the machine out on the, the lifter, which is underneath the machine. Um, and then the paramedic and the doctor as well will assist him with that. And from there we'll, we'll launch and oftentimes it's a bit of an adventure really because you don't know what you're going to go to or what you're going to find. You never really know where it's going to be. And, and that, that's a good side. It's also a challenging side. Um, from there, once we're out and about, we um, will make various calls uh, to different agencies, such as Queensland Ambulance or Queensland Fire Rescue, uh, to see whether they're on scene. If they are, we'll coordinate with those and they'll generally give us good information about the pad. Um, pilots are always a bit concerned about wires, they're hard to see, other obstacles, the downdraft I talked about before, it's a 90 kilometre per hour downdraft, so we kind of are thinking about all those things as we're coming into land. Uh, once we're safely on the ground, uh, myself and the crewman, being non-medical personnel, we sort of become wardsmen at that point, so you know, we'll hand medical packs to the, uh, the, crew, the, the medical crews, the doctor and the paramedic, try and help out as much as we can with setting up the medical equipment and the stretcher and then we'll work out which hospital we're going to as well, a bit more flight planning. Uh, from there we retrieve the patient uh, back to a, the, the most suitable uh, hospital and once we arrive at the hospital, one of the good things, particularly with some of the hospitals in Brisbane, is we land on the roof and the patient goes straight down into uh, emergency and there they get the best care they possibly can in South East Queensland. And from there we return where we'll refuel the machine. These are big thirsty machines, you know, they're burning three or four hundred litres an hour. We can really only stay airborne for about two and a half hours anyway, so we're always thinking about fuel and so forth. Uh, once we're back here, we do what's called a post-flight inspection, make sure everything's still where it was supposed to be before we took off, um, and then it's back into the waiting game. Uh, and that Generally we do two day shifts and then two night shifts, so that's both day and night, um, and that'd be pretty much a, a typical day, I guess. Uh, my most unusual flight was when I tried to rescue a dog and failed. <laughs> uh, the thing about rescuing a dog is you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. People will hate you um, if you just left it there and didn't try. But if you do try and something happens and people are going to go, why were you trying to get a stupid dog with a multi-million dollar helicopter and a crew? Uh, the way it transpired was a, a couple of guys decided to go hiking up Mount Maroon on New Year's Eve a few years ago, taking their dog Diff with them. Um, and I don't know if they were completely sober, um, but anyway, they managed to make their way to the top uh, where they promptly got fogged in, got lost. The dog ended up dropping down onto a ledge, which they followed and ended up on a thousand foot cliff face. Uh, at the same time as we were hovering there trying to execute the, the, uh, the rescue, there was a Channel 9 helicopter and a Channel 7 helicopter either side, kind of having a bit of a look and putting us on camera. Anyway, cut a long story short, we were able to rescue these two guys successfully, but then it was the dilemma as well, what do we do with the dog? And I just remember Diff the dog kind of putting his head on his paws and looking at me um, and then just disappearing up into the fog. Uh, and that was it, there was nothing else we could do. A few days later, um, after all the bad weather had cleared, a rock climber went and was able to get him out. So it had a happy ending. The other thing to remember, I think, with these machines is that they're community machines. Uh, we always have an open invitation out there. If people want to come in and have a look, they can. Just knock on the door. Um, all we ask is that, um, you know, in the future, people make, continue to make donations, and, and we're very, very thankful for those donations. Thanks, Adrian. See you back after the break when you can stay connected.
Welcome back. Next on the show, we have Richard Jordan, an up-and-coming Brisbane playwright whose work Machina will be featuring at the Labuat Indie season this year. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thanks for having me. Lovely to have you. Now, the Korean Mail tells me that Richard is a new breed of playwright on the loose. He brings a fresh young voice to theatre and with it an insight beyond the stereotypes of Generation Y. <laughs> Tell me, what is it that makes you love playwriting so much? Um, Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I suppose I love the immediate connection that you have with an audience. Yeah. So you can actually sit and um, in the audience and, and hear them either laugh or react or gasp or whatever to what you've written. Fairly recently, I mean, compared to, say, film or television, there's often a really long development process. And Absolutely. then as a writer, you're often quite distanced from how it's produced, yeah. whereas in theatre you can be much more involved. So yeah. I do love that. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Mm. Now, I do know that... Um, you had the opportunity to study over in London and, and develop that through a, a special program um, yeah. for writers <clears throat> and things like that. Can you tell me, how has that influenced your writing and, and changed maybe the way that you look at things or developed ideas that you've had? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was a, um, a, theater, it was a theater in London called the Royal Court Theatre, which is a famous theater there, and they run a young writers program for yep. sort of 26 and under mm. um, young playwrights. And um, I, I went over there in sort of 2007, 2008, yep. and, um, yeah, it just completely changed my life. It changed my approach to writing. Yeah. Um, just lifted my game and lifted my standards. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I really seriously believe I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without it. Yeah, mm. sure, absolutely. So did that lead <coughs> into, um, obviously you won the Queensland Premier's Drama Award for yeah. 25 Down, yeah. um, which is a very exciting honour. Did you think that sort of influenced that particular work and has helped you sort of develop it from there? Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't have written that play without the court, you know, all those years ago. And um, and I think having that support network in that really intense period and yeah. having um, a major institution believe in your work and mm. giving you the opportunity and saying, no matter what happens, we're going to sort of put this on, it just gives you the courage to take risks and be bold. And um, yeah, it's something that we're kind of lacking a bit here. So. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And it is that something we can develop in Australia, do you think, with, with more support for developing playwrights and artists and, and that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, I would love to see that happen. We have, um, there are some programs around and certainly yeah. universities and such, but mm. um, which I have myself done a university um, creative writing degree and they're great. Yeah. But there is something about doing a very dedicated playwriting course within the confines of a theatre. Yeah. And you're actually engaging with directors and actors and you're actually part of that ensemble, which I think is really important for playwrights to be in the theatre. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you, actually. Um, now, I want to talk quickly about Machina, the, yeah. sorry, Machina, yeah. the, the play. <laughs> now, it's a weird you know, title. Magna, yeah. Machina, one of those two. Yeah. Um, now, you're obviously uh, working on that with director Katrina Hebbard, which is yeah. um, very exciting. Yeah. Now, I understand you used a possible campaign to, uh, you know, get that yeah. final bit of funding to sort of put it on. Can you talk a bit about how that's, you know, made things possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, exactly. I mean, I with, uh, with that campaign, we... Um, I think we raised about over five thousand dollars, and we sort of just did it a few months ago, actually. Yeah. And I was just kind of overwhelmed by the support of, of local people um, to help us sort of basically build the set and, and get costumes. I mean, putting a show on so expensive. Uh. And um, when we were accepted into La Boite Indie, unfortunately, the turnaround was so fast that we didn't have a chance to be able to apply for government funding. So we mm. had to sort of secure money in other ways. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And it's so great that the community is able to get involved in that way and support. Yeah that type of um, yeah, campaign. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show, Richard. Thank it's you. been a pleasure having you. To round out the show today, we are joined by Ash and Louie, half of local Toowoomba indie rock group Mercury Sun. They'll be performing an acoustic version of their song, Cecilia, today. Their debut EP, Waiting for a Beat to Break To, is now available on iTunes, and you can find the link on our website. This true will be tested again. I'm a receiver of the love you hold closer to the end. And if time, so time could change, would you try and smooth the bed? I'm a daydreamer, but these dreams won't last forever. You say I'm a loser, but I'm winning. Inside my own head, I'm an abuser, but I'll quit before the addiction 
Cecilia, don't you know? If you call, I'll come running low. Cecilia, don't you know? If you call, I'll come running. Don't you know, if you call, I'll come running, no, Cecilia, don't you know, if you call, I'll come running. Whoa, Cecilia, don't you know? If you call, I'll come running away. Oh, Cecilia, don't you know? If you call, I'll come running. Yeah. Cecilia, 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 back to you. Thanks for joining us today on Connected TV. Thank you to all our guests, Paul Pasali, Michael Beatty, Richard Jordan, Adrian Park and Mercury Sun. For more information about anything you've seen on today's program, please head to our website. I'm your host, Tammy Lindy, and I'll see you next week when you can stay connected.